Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Mary Elizabeth Williams, and your next big read is here. Jennifer Weiner's Mrs. Everybody is in stores. Now it is the story of two sisters, Joe and Bethy, for those of you who may have read some Louisa May Alcott in your life, uh, coming of age during the women's liberation movement, spanning all the way to the future. Mm -hmm. In it, but not in a science fiction way. No. Uh, it's the story of love, family, from the internationally best-selling author of 12 previous novels and a lot of other stuff too, including mm -hmm. Good in Bed, In Her Shoes, Little Earthquakes, as well as the memoir Hungry Heart. That was the last time I talked to that you. That was, was it. For Hungry yeah, Heart. but that was just on the phone. Yeah, you this is. You didn't get me in all I of didn't my get, like dressed up glory. And the eye, and the eyelashes. Right. The eyelashes. Well, if you go to Lash Bash in Philadelphia on Sansom Street and have a couple hundred bucks, they can be your lashes too. All right. People I, are like, are they yours? And I'm like, I, I paid for yeah, them. I so bought them, so yeah. They're now, mine. now they are. So now they're mine, at now least for mine. a while. They're gorgeous. Thank you. Nice. Thank good, you. good uh, eyelash. Good game. investment. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. So let's let's also talk about the book. What do you yeah. say? We didn't yeah. do a little bit about the book too. Oh, fine. Okay. <laughs> this book, Jen. It's so amazing. It is big. It mm -hmm. is sweeping. Mm -hmm. It is ambitious yeah. AF. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me because your last two, when I talked to you three years ago, you had just done a children's book. Yeah. You had done a memoir. Yeah. This is a very different kind of book for this you too. Yes. This is historical. Yeah. Uh -huh. What 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 made you t try this? It's so interesting. Okay, so here, the story of where Mrs. Everything came from. I wanted, after the election, after the 2016 election, when I think a lot of fiction people and novelists, and especially those of us whose fiction tends to be on the more fun and entertaining side, we're doing a kind of gut check and saying like, all right, like what, what am I called to do at this moment in time? And I wanted to write a big dystopian thriller about a future where abortion was illegal and where birth control was illegal. I wanted to write Red Clocks. If you've read Lenny Zumas's book, Red Clocks, which is that, basically, it's this dystopian, you know, women can't have fertility treatments, women can't get birth control, women can't have abortions. And I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I just could not make it work. I am not Margaret Atwood as much as I would love to be Margaret Atwood. And so then I'm sort of sitting here thinking, what am I going to do now? And I'd always wanted to write a historical novel. Susan Isaacs is one of my all-time favorite writers, and one of her favorite books of mine is Almost Paradise, which does the same kind of thing as Mrs. Everything. It takes on generations, and you go back and you see people's grandparents and people's parents and how they were sort of formed in the crucible of expectations and limits. And I wanted to do that. And then there was a voice inside that said, is that book big enough? It's just another sister story. And I had to tell that voice to, that voice to shut up because I, I had to really like argue with myself and remind myself that the personal is political and that women's stories can be big stories even though we are not taught to think of them that way. And I just had to get over my fear of doing all the research, which was like no joke, but I, finally like gathered up my courage and went to the library and here we are. Yeah, and that's, I'm so glad you brought that up because it is so traditionally that stories about war are stories yes. and stories about, you know, men things are stories, but stories about family right. are, are domestic. Right. They're little, Women's they're fiction. small. It's yes. chick lit. Chick lit. Chick lit. Right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a story, if it's a story about women, then it's not interesting to everyone and you have to package it so carefully like I was talking uh, in my reading last night like this topic came up and I was talking about Meg Wolitzer's books and how carefully those covers are designed to make sure that there's like there's not a woman there's not a beach there's not a flower there's not a there's not a you know there, there's no sort of Eiffel Tower with a beautifully dressed woman photographed from behind in the mists like those covers are like the, the subtext of those covers is, men, you can read this and be okay. And You will I, not be embarrassed you will not on be an embarrassed. airplane. You will not get your period. It will all be <laughs> fine. There are women in the book, but don't worry, don't worry. We've made it safe for you. And I 
hope that men read Mrs. Everything. Like, I really, really do. But um, as you can see, there are women I, on the cover. But, the, but you might have to, it's abstract enough. Exactly. I thought that, like, maybe. The men can think they're just shapes. Just shapes. <laughs> just circles and, and swoopies and, you know, shapes. Doesn't necessarily have to be ladies, right? Oh, I mean, I, right. I, you, I, you know, you but think you know what this. I mean, right? Of course I like, do. when you think about, like, I mean, my my older six, my daughter, my sixteen year old, the the grumpy one who hates me, came to my reading the other night, and she's like, "Ah, oh, it was a room full of middle aged white ladies." And I said, "Right." And I said, "Okay, a, what do you think I am?" I said, "B, what do you think you are going to be?" And then I was like, "Lucy, who do you think reads any book? Right? Women, you know, not all white women, but." Black women are enormous consumers of fiction, but women are the readers. And we read books by women, we read books by men, we read all the books. And nobody has to do like any sort of special arranging to like signal to us that like Dave Eggers is okay or John Cheever is okay. Like we just, you know, we read men in school and we were taught that that was literature with a capital L and so we read books by men. Men did not grow up reading books by women in school and believing that that was literature. And I think that for a lot of men, it's like, oh, it's all romance, or it's all fluff, or it's not for me. And I think that's really unfortunate. I think men are missing great stories. Yeah, they absolutely are, because it's just about the human condition, mm -hmm. and about family, and mm -hmm. about relationships, and about the dynamics. Mm -hmm. And this is also about um, a 70 year period yes, yes. in American history. Yes. It would not be a ter like it's not a bad thing no. to know about what went down, what in, went this, down. in this period. So yes. I want to talk to you about that mm -hmm. because you are a former journalist. I am. And I, reading this, I could feel you, I could feel mm -hmm. you doing the work, yeah. Jennifer. Yeah. I, even to the little, like, when I got to 2003 and someone has a Blackberry uh -huh. and someone is on the zone diet, right. I was like, Mwah. Yeah, like right. that is, you, right. you went back in time, even to 2003. Well, I, it was, some of it I could remember. Like I remember, well, I had my Blackberry a lot longer than most people. I like just gave it up. Like I, I didn't want to use an iPhone because the typing was hard and the typing still is. I have like really huge thumbs. but. You know, there were, are great. they're enormous, but there are pieces I could remember, like obviously the pieces that I lived through. Like I remember the 90s pretty well. I remember the 80s-ish. I barely remember the 70s when I was a kid. You know, the 60s, the 50s, like that was where I really had to like dive into the magazines and the newspapers and the classified ads, which were like always the most interesting part of the newspaper. Um, and. I wanted to get the details right. Like I wanted to really like make you feel like you were there, like you could feel that shag carpet under your feet, or you could taste the new Coke in the 80s, or like whatever it was. The Jello. The, the Jello. Jello. Like, the Jello comes up a lot in this <laughs> yes, book. Yes, I know. I don't, I don't think Jello is going to have me be like their brand ambassador anytime not, soon. Not because Sorry, of Jello. Spoiler. Sorry about it. Spoiler uh, <laughs> Jello meets a bad end. Yeah. <laughs> Jello, Jello gets flung in, in unfortunate places. But it's, um, it's those kinds of little details that make it very real. And also learning about. It's very clear, like just even the little moments of this is the, what the experience of being an African American veteran yes. of the Vietnam War would be like. Right. Things that again, guess what, men? There okay. are men in this book. There who, are men like, in this who, book. Perhaps do, we should have put one on the cover. Maybe that was the we maybe like really phallic, big, like just a thrusting, big, a big pointed, penis right on the cover. Pointed, maybe that would, yes. We'll see if that would work. That the symbol. It, it we could try. Maybe mm. for the paperback. Just think about it, Jennifer. You never know. But this is also, this is a book about history and mm -hmm. about the work that you've done researching it, but it's also really personal. Yes. And as someone who talked to you about your last book, mm -hmm. there is a very crucial element mm -hmm. in this book that is drawn from, from your family. From my family. So the story of my family is that my parents both grew up in Detroit in middle class Jewish families. They both went to the University of Michigan. They met and they got married and my dad became a doctor. And they moved to Connecticut and they had four kids and they lived in the suburbs and my dad left in the 80s just kind of decided he was done being a father and being a husband and left and my mom was a single mom for 10 years with you know teenagers and young adults and all of us sort of trying to get our lives started and then in her mid 50s fell in love with a woman 
And we were all shocked and like none of us had seen this coming. And so I remember like being on a conference call with my siblings and be like, did you know? Did you know? Did you have any idea? And like, you know, well, she, she played softball. And, you know, <laughs> that's a stereotype. But, you know, so my mom, um, her first girlfriend was this much younger woman who was closer to my age than my mom's, which like added this whole other layer of like awkward weirdness to it. Um, and then they broke up, and then my mom met Claire, who's been her partner for the last 16 years. And I, I mean, my mother would tell me when I was growing up, like I would complain about things, and she would say, it's all material. So when I grew up and like used that material in fiction, you know, and, and sort of had characters like complaining about their like, oh, gay mom, you know, she, she was okay with that, but like I, I started, as I got older, and as my daughters got older, and as I started to think about what her life must have really been like, and what it, what it must be like when there's a part of you that you can't share, that there's this secret you're always keeping, there's, there's something you know about yourself that you can't be open to the world about, and how that shapes your life. And I wanted to write about that because I'm, I'm interested in women's stories and, and women's secrets and sort of the way we are in public versus the way we are in private, the way we are with men versus the way we are with friends or family or sisters. And I, I wanted to do a more um, thorough and respectful telling of my mom's story. And so that's where Mrs. Everything, that was where it was born. And this character, and this is, I just want to run through it because when mm -hmm. you talk about the secrets that women carry mm -hmm. and we talk about where we are now at this moment in history, which right. is a not great. Uh, hashtag believe her. A hashtag not great not also. Great. And yet these characters through multiple generations go through, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list it, oh a couple of them, uh -huh. molestation, yep. rape, mm -hmm. illegal abortion. I promise there's funny stuff it's, too. Oh, it's hilarious. Yeah. It's so, it's so, so funny. <laughs> Um, Jello. Yes, uh, Jello. Uh huh. Um, right. Being closeted. Being closeted. Having an interracial romance. Yep. Uh huh. Down through like being, you know, being a, a sugar daddy. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. going on a sugar daddy. Yep. Being sexually harassed and abused in the workplace. In the workplace. Place. Being judged for not wanting kids. Being judged for not wanting kids. Mm -hmm. Weight. Yep. Being shamed for your size. Yep. For having the audacity to put on weight. Yep. All of these things that women do go through, and right. do, so, and not just women, but but especially women, go through and suffer through in quiet. And yeah. in times past, there was no back and forth. There right. was no conversation. Right. And this book is a conversation about that. That's what I'm hoping. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, so there's two sisters in Mrs. Everything. There's Joe and Bethy. And Jo, as in Little Women, she's the rebel, she's the tomboy, she wants to be a writer, she wants to live in a city, she wants to have a big life. And as in Little Women, ends up married to a guy who sort of um, sniffs at her writerly ambitions and ends up as a mother for a while. Um, my, my Jo, I was able to give a different ending to. But so then there's Bethy, who's the good girl, right? And Bethy in, in Little Women is the sister who dies. Um, and I, I'm sorry if I just spoiled Little Women for anyone who hasn't read it yet. But, but you've had like 200 yeah, years. Yeah, so come on, catch up. So Bethy, you know, she's, she's the pretty, you know, suffers in noble silence sister. And, and then when she dies, it's this like moment of heartbreak for this family. But she's like, you know, don't don't weep for me. So I wanted to take a good girl, right? And I wanted to talk about what the world does to good girls. So here's my Bethy, who is shiny as a new penny, and she's bright, and she loves to perform, and she loves to be the center of attention, and she's Queen Esther in the Purim play. And then there's this uncle. And what happens with Bethy and the uncle, I am discovering, has happened with a lot of women. Like, I, I did one, like, video chat with a group of readers about this book, like, a couple weeks ago. And I was like, you know, and then this terrible thing happens to Bethy. And right down the screen scrolled, that happened to me. That happened to my sister. That happened to my best friend. That happened to my partner. Like, just boom, 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 boom. And I was just like, God, I, 
I so wanted to believe that I was making this up. And of course I know what happens, but boy, it happens a lot. And everything, every single thing that we've just talked about affects everybody. It affects everybody. Every single person in the world mm -hmm. has or knows someone who's been sexually abused, mm -hmm. who has been sexually assaulted, who has had an abortion. Had an abortion, right. And, and with Bethy's story, I, I wanted to show the importance of language because she doesn't have the words really to even tell anybody what's going on. Like she can't say he's molesting me. Like she doesn't know that word and or abusing me even. And, and all she can come up with is, was like, you know, he's hugging me too long. And her mother, who is a widow now, who's supporting this family, who's out in the workplace, who is enjoying her life in the workplace and probably feeling like guilty and conflicted about that, is like, what, what do you mean he's hugging you too long? And Bethy ends up confiding in her sister and Joe is the one who sort of takes care of business on her behalf. But I was, as I was writing the book, you know, and as I was sort of like putting Bethy through like the, it, it felt a little like perils of Paulina. It was like one thing after another and I had to be careful that it wasn't like too much. But I, I wanted readers to think about the importance of naming things, like how once you've got a term for something or a word for something or language for something, that's when you can start to solve it. That's when you can start to fix it. Um, and, and so as we move forward and we think about the gains we've made and, and perhaps the ground we're losing, I wanted people to think about the importance of naming things and speaking out loudly and, and telling our stories bravely and knowing that our stories matter in the world. Mr. Rogers, Quote, mm -hmm. what is mentionable mm -hmm. is manageable. Yep, yep, it's yep. that simple. So yep. speaking of telling our stories, mm -hmm. you know we want to get into this. Mm -hmm. Past nine years. Uh -huh. The past <laughs> nine years, because yes. I've been on this journey. Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. You have been speaking out yes. in a very bold, brave, to the point of being really savage. Really savage for this. Mm -hmm talking about the sexism in the literary world, right. in the way that women's stories are written about, mm -hmm. in the way that women's literature is talked about, right. in the way that women in general, right. as a group or right. a demographic, right. are talked about. Right. Now, when you started having this conversation, mm -hmm. you were pilloried oh, yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. I watched that stuff go down uh -huh. on Twitter. Uh -huh. And now, here mm -hmm. we are. Here we are. Here we are. Mm -hmm. And can we just say, <laughs> you were right. You were right well, about a lot of this mm -hmm. stuff. And you have in this book, without giving anything away, mm -hmm. you take on, mm -hmm. in a pretty explicit way, mm -hmm. some of that hypocrisy. Right. What does it feel like? What does it feel like now to look around and see that there has been this reckoning? There has been this reckoning. I mean, I again, this goes back to naming a problem and being able to point at something and say, "Yes, this is real." Like when I started talking about it, and Jody Paco started talking about it and saying, "Women's books are not reviewed as often," and we were told we were lying. We were told we were jealous. We were told we were just making it all up. We were told we were hysterical. We were told that our books are crap, and that's why no one reviews them. And then someone started counting. And the organization Vita every year does its count, and they discovered that, lo and behold, there was a, a true discrepancy. And they started calling editors, and then reporters started calling editors and saying, hey, New Republic, you reviewed 17 books by men and one book by a woman. What do you have to say for yourself? Or, hey, Paris Review, you published short stories by 75% 75 men last year. What's up with that? And and Once, also discovering mm -hmm, the rot mm -hmm. that was actually going on behind the scenes well, at some of these publications. I was going to say that, like you know, some of the um, some of the biggest offenders have been um, ha have have been me tooed, as we say in my house, and are no longer um, you know at at the head of these organizations. But I, I think that there's been a shift. I think that there are women at the helm of some of these publications, which makes a, an enormous difference. 
I think that a lot of editors have tried to do the right thing, have said, yes, we know there's a problem here, we are trying to address it. And even the editors who haven't said that, they get called on the carpet. And if they say, we review the best books, and if the best books are by men, we will continue to review books that are just by men, people say, well, let's talk about your criteria. Like, what is best to you? How are you defining it? Who's defining it? Who's on your staff? Let's take a look at that masthead. And I've seen real progress. And for me personally, you know, to see this book called Ambitious and to see people call it a great American novel and to see people say, like, this book has something to say and it speaks to readers, I mean, for me, that's just tremendously gratifying and rewarding. And I, I don't want to, like, you know, do a big victory dance or anything because it's not it's not fixed yet. It's not all better yet. But are we moving forward? Yes, I think we are. And in a way that is, you know, I, I love this book because it is at a moment when there is so much despair mm -hmm. and hopelessness. Yeah. This is a book that looks at that. Yep. But is also ultimately joyful and hopeful. Joyful and funny and hopeful and, and yes, sexy. Sexy, yes. And I mean, super entertaining because that's my job at the end of the day. Like, I don't want to write polemics. I don't want people feeling like they've just spent 400 pages watching me stand on a soapbox and yell at them about reproductive rights, even though I want to do that sometimes. Um, and yeah, there's there's some pretty sexy sex scenes, some which sexy sex. were pretty. I mean. Honest to God, like when I gave the book to my mom, I was just like, she she was at my house for Passover, so I like give her the advanced readers copy, and I'm sitting there watching her read it. And I'm thinking, oh God, please leave, please leave, please just <laughs> please just go, like just get in the car before you get to the sex scene, because like I don't want to sit here and watch you like read about like two teenage girls in a vibrator. I just do not. And that's why you have good boundaries, yeah. Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you. Boundaries. Boundaries always important in boundaries. work, in home, anything. The book again is called Mrs. Everything. Yes. It is. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's fun. It's fun. Even men will like it. Even men should read this. <laughs> yes. Put it in your beach bag, fellas. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. This was fantastic.